Ele is a full professor at University of Juiz de Fora in Minas Gerais. And he's been in a lot of places visiting or as a postdoc. For instance, he's been in University of Saragossa some years ago as a postdoc. He's orig originally had a PhD in Tomsk University. His advisor was Josef Bushbinder, one of the greatest physics in the field. And Eli is also one of the greatest theoretical physics working here in Brazil in the field of perturbative quantum gravity, uh, especially in subjects such as quadratic gravity, conformal gravity, uh, trace anomaly, uh, renormalization group applied to quantum gravity, cosmology. I can go on, but let me stop right now. And, mm -hmm. and guys, I hope you have fun. So please, Ali, you can start whatever you want. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel. So for me, this uh, institute is very, very special because, and I would like first to thank uh, administration of the institute, regardless here is only Gaston. Uh, I'm not sure he's now in uh, administration, but because uh, it makes some essential part of my life to start with. In 97, uh, Rogerio ordered me seminar here with the title Quantum Gravity Problems and Prospects. And I did it. And after that, we started some collaboration with Alexander Belayev and made a lot of things, <laughs> actually. So it was really fruitful. And then second point is that, uh, and many, many other things happen here, usually after questions of Rogerio Rosenfeld. But I asked him today to come here and ask some new question. And he said he has some meeting. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it is already started badly <laughs> for me. So and second, I gave here like four years ago, maybe uh, lectures about introductory lectures to semi-classical and quantum gravity. There are five lectures. They are available on the home page of the Institute. And uh, so if you wish, you can follow this lecture. Some people do it and uh, call me and ask questions, and I, we, I respond by Skype, so it's perfectly possible. OK, so to, uh, I start my two lectures uh, course uh, with uh, one hour and 20 minutes, Gabriel, each. <laughs> so maybe less, and I, I hope not more, <laughs> so not to torture you too much. And so it will be about very particular issue of decoupling in a quantum field theory and a quantum gravity. It is not a big issue, decoupling. It's very particular, technical. So I will give very technical, uh, two, two technical seminars, let's say. But by the end of the second seminar tomorrow, I will try to explain uh, something that uh, uh, does not exist. I learned this from Sasha Belayev, that uh, experimentalists, they start uh, statistical uh, treatment of data before the data are taken. It happened with LHC and with uh, uh, others, with cosmological projects. So I will do something like that. So when uh, it would be interesting to make some calculations. But before making calculations, sometimes it's interesting to know what you, will, uh, what you can expect at the end. And I will show you tomorrow uh, what we can expect from decoupling in higher derivative quantum gravity and in general from the... Uh, momentum subtraction uh, scheme calculations in higher derivative quantum gravity based on what we know about decoupling and what we know about quantum gravity. So let's go. So uh, the uh, plan for today includes the following things. First, I will say something qualitative, what means decoupling at the qu uh, classical level. Then I show you uh, how to calculate non-local uh, form factors for the self-energy type diagrams. Then uh, we'll explain in details uh, how we take high energy and low energy limits. And uh, then we go to more spe special thing uh, about extracting form factors in semi-classical gravity, which was done uh, in 2003 uh, uh, by Eduard Gorbar from Kiev and myself. And Gorbar went exactly from here to Juiz de Fora. And then uh, I will show, we did it with diagrams. Then I show you how the same can, can be done uh, using heat kernel methods. Then instead of months of calculations, you have hours of calculations. The difference is dramatic. 
and then uh, I will say a few words about randomization group. And this is, uh, I put it red because this is a hot issue, because this is uh, uh, something we don't know how to do. So how to get running of cosmological and Newton constants would be very interesting to have it, but we, we cannot, we have no instruments for that. And finally, I will, since I saw the slides are very short, so I added this part of implications of decoupling for the trace anomaly is something we did with Manuela Sorey, he is here, and Eduard Gorber. So, now, re uh, further reading, let's say. The first paper of decoupling is this Appelquist and Carasone classical work in QED. Then there is a very good re re uh, re uh, review paper by Manohar, okay? So I recommend everybody, but it's for particle physics, but in principle, we learned a lot from it. Then concerning heat kernel methods, this is a paper by Barwinski wilkowski when they uh, found the solution for the heat kernel. There was similar paper by, there was similar paper by Ivan Avramidi, uh, more or less the same time, but everybody said this. So and then there are two hour papers with Gorbar, like even three maybe, because there is third, uh, about spontaneous symmetry breaking case, and uh, so something else. And then, then uh, tomorrow I will discuss this part, which was uh, done with Wagner, who is here, and actually by Wagner, I would even say, okay. And finally, if you want some introduction to quantum gravity, we wrote recently a textbook with Buchbinder. Uh, then the first part is introduction to quantum field theory, and second is introduction to semi-classical quantum gravity with exercises in all this. I think it is the first example of uh, textbook on quantum gravity. Okay, let's go. So first of all, what means, maybe I will go here because Otherwise, my neck is in risk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is an example of uh, classical decoupling. So you have a uh, Euclidean propagator of uh, heavy particle, very heavy particle at low uh, energies. It means in Euclid after weak rotation that k square is much smaller than the m square, and then it's natural to make this kind of expansion. And what you observe is that the propagati propagating does not happen because the first term is 1 over m square, it's a constant, the second term is also kind of vertex and so on. So propagation disappears quadratically, okay? This is a very clear example of what we call decoupling. The question is, do we have something like that in the loop corrections? It's not a trivial question because in loops, you integrate over internal lines, and you integrate in momentum from zero to infinity. So your natural question is, uh, if you integrate from zero to infinity, how you can expect that something like that happens? Okay, if it happens at low energies, low momenta, you don't, don't expect this at high momenta. The whole point is that if you take this type of diagrams, uh, the, you have to compare uh, energy or momentum of external lines with the mass of quantum field. Okay, and the fact that you integrate over internal lines, internal line means quantum field, yeah? And you compare uh, energy or momentum of external field, which is wavy in this case. So, uh, and then you have something like, uh, something like decoupling or uh, yeah, you usually, typically, you have something like decoupling. So let us start with technical introduction. Uh, once again, full details can be found in our book uh, with Buchbinder, so I think I just reproduced. By the way, there is a ratum for those who are interested. Uh, David Rodriguez from UFIS made for me homepage recently. I get a homepage. And the only thing which I put to this homepage is this erratum to the book. So it's very, there are like 100 corrections and more 100 came because people send it. So <laughs> the typical integral is like that. We can see that this integral is divergent uh, logarithmically. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, you can ask. You're wel welcome to ask, okay? Uh, it's Euclidean already. And, uh, yeah, you can see that P is an external momenta, and K is quantum momenta in the internal line. So this can be lambda phi 4 theory, lambda phi 3 theory, it doesn't matter. This part is uh, always the same. So how we do it? We, we let us use dimensional regularization. It means that instead of four-dimensional space, we go to the space of dimension 2 omega. Omega is typically complex. And then our purpose is to write this integral uh, in 
to, or in the dimension to omega in the following form. Uh, pole part, okay? Then finite term and the term which vanish when omega goes back to 2. And, of course, this last part is typically not very interesting. So, but sometimes there are exceptions, okay? <laughs> so, so you, can, you, you have this integral, okay? And then you use this representation, which is quite trivial, okay? You can just check it. Uh, after that, uh, we can do the following. We change the order of integrations and uh, take integral. Then after changing the order of integration, the integral over momentum is Gaussian. Everybody knows how to take Gaussian integral. Actually, this is the unique integral which we know how to take. So we use our experience with Gaussian integrals. Okay, we are sorry that we don't know how to take any other integral, but this is one we know. <laughs> so we take integral over momentum and we get this result. So everything reduced to the integral over two artificial parameters, alpha 1, alpha 2, and uh, it depends on p square. p square is this external momenta. Then we will need these uh, for, uh, formulas for the gamma functions, for 2 minus omega, 1 minus omega, and minus omega. This is directly uh, direct consequence of the basic features of the gamma functions, so it's not difficult to get these formulas. Another thing you need is the formula for the volume of the m-dimensional sphere of radius r. Okay? And here in this formula you can just replace m by 2 omega. Or if you wish, uh, using mathematical language, make analytic continuation to 2 omega. Okay? And then you get uh, the volume of the sphere in the complex uh, space, uh, the space of complex dimension. Okay? Which is something strange, but uh, we can do it. Now, after taking these integrals, we have uh, this result, okay? So this integral is quite uh, simple. You can see that in principle it can be taken. But here is omega minus 2, which is some uh, irrational and maybe complex, complex quantity. So it's not easy to take this integral in this form. So what we can do, we have to remember that our purpose is to make an expansion in the power in the powers of omega minus 2. Okay, because omega by the end of the day has to go to 2. So we do this expansion in the following way. First, we separate m square with the corresponding power, and then we write the rest as usual, we send it to logarithm. Okay, and then when we send it to logarithm, we can expand into series, uh, power series in 2 minus omega. So it becomes like that. The remaining term, the analysis of this expression shows that it's relevant. Why? Because here you have 2 minus omega, and here you have omega minus 2 square. So it belongs to this group, which is goes to 0 when omega goes to 2. So after all these manipulations, we arrive to this relatively simple expression. And here we have the integral. It, typically, uh, particle physics uh, people don't take this integral and work in the integral representation. But we found more... Uh, interesting to take the integral, which is also not difficult. And after you take the integral, you get this expression, you see. And now a square here is this guy, is 4k square over k square plus 4m square. Or if we go to the uh, coordinate representation, you can write it as this formula with box and m square. This makes sense, especially if you are interested in the effective action, because effective action we like to uh, formulate in uh, coordinate space and write uh, so momentum uh, representation is not the best choice for us. Good. So, by the end of the day, we have this expression. This is a universal, almost universal expression for all theories. What changes is that uh, typically the coefficient of uh, y changes and the coefficient of divergence is changed. So let me remember once again, what is y? Y is this formula, okay? Uh, believe me, this formula is absolutely the same for any theory. So a square is this guy. So we have this expression. And this expression has explicitly uh, uh, three terms. Two of them are proportional. It's divergence, one over two minus omega. And the second one is uh, log of mu square. Okay, here is m square because we work it with uh, massive uh, theory. Uh, 
uh, what happens in the massless theory, I will show on the next transparencies. And then we have this, what we call form factor Y. Okay? And if you ask me, where is physical output of this calculation? It is certainly in Y. Because Y is a form factor. It, it is something which depends on external momenta. And this guy is divergence. And divergence we are going to subtract. Okay? Because when we make renormalization, we add the counter term in the simplest possible scheme of, and subtract the divergence. Divergence is going to die. <laughs> and what is going to, to remain is Y. So why, what is the importance of the third term of log 4 pi mu square over m square? It has two, it is a connection term. Because from one side, its coefficient is always equal to 1 over 2 minus omega. There are no exceptions. It's equal to 2 minus omega. And the second point, as you will see on the next transparencies, uh, the logarithmic leading part of y, when external momenta is big, gives you exactly the same coefficient. It's also the rule which has no exceptions. From the physics side, this means that the so-called minimal subtraction scheme of renormalization, which means that we work with mu, mu is artificial parameter which does not exist, and in physics, and momenta which lives in y, okay, at ultraviolet limit are proportional. So what, by the end of the day, we have the following situation. Divergence is control dependence on mu, and dependence on mu in the ultraviolet controls dependence on momenta. Okay? And it, that's all story. I mean, for some, starting from this point, I will just uh, discuss this result <laughs> in different situations. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Let me come back uh, one step back and just show you if it is here. Maybe it is not. Yeah, at which point we introduce mu. Mu is introduced here because we, I did not write it, unfortunately. So when we don't like to have m square in this power. So we, we, we have to manage to put this omega minus 2 in some civilized way, let's say. And for this, you always need to introduce mu. Mu is artificial dimensional parameter. Okay, uh, the physics uh, and mu, uh, mu has no its own interpretation. We have to give interpretation to mu. And typically, if you are working with the scattering problems, mu is associated with the transferred momenta, uh, momentum. And uh, if we work in, let's say, with effective potential, then mu we associate with scalar field. In some other cases, we will associate mu with something else. And there are cases when we really don't know how to associate mu with something. I will tell this in the, uh, last, in the last part of the today's lecture. So again, we have divergences with this logarithmic term. Okay, this has very good uh, correspondence between divergences and mu square, logarithm of mu square. And then we have non-local form factor. And this is the guy of our interest, the part of our interest. So one interesting thing about divergences, about logarithmic divergences, is their universality. And even more interesting for me was to discover that the only paper when this was uh, climate is this Abdul Salam paper of 51, which is quite uh, a long time ago. And he noted that you can use any regularization, okay, and you always have the same coefficient of the uh, logarithmic divergences. So I guess since you are uh, PhD students or postdocs or uh, professors, uh, each of us uh, has uh, remembers like five or more regularizations, okay? It's always the rule that the coefficient of the uh, logarithmic divergences is always the same. The rule of correspondence, for instance, between four-dimensional cutoff and uh, dimensional is this, okay? So if you calculate divergences in dimensional regularization, be sure that in uh, uh, four-dimensional cutoff you have this uh, rule of correspondence. Uh, maybe a little bit different rule of correspondence, let's say, to Pauli Wheeler's or to uh, some other regularization. But uh, there is something like that, and after that, all coefficients fit. Okay? Uh, so. I? No, maybe if I, make mis if I made a mistake, <laughs> you can correct it. <laughs> No, omega is cutoff parameter, is dimensional. No, omega is dimensional. The ratio is dimensionless. 
Well, 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 it depends. If, you, if I send, no, wait, if I send n to 4, it has no dimension, but then 1 over epsilon becomes, remember that there's this relation between divergences, Gaston. Okay, left hand side is divergence infinite and right hand side is infinite, okay, but they go to infinity in, in the same way. This is what this formula tells, okay? So uh, we will have one more uh, rule of correspondence later on. But it's good observation, of course, because I, I could remove here mu with n minus 4 and then nobody would complain. But in principle, the, the philosophy is this what I said. Now, yeah, actually this mu n minus 4 is representing the remnants of this logarithm, if you want. Okay, so it, it depends on how you work with the log. Good. So, once again, in ultraviolet, we have automatically uh, perfect correspondence between high k square uh, limit and high mu square limit. This corresponds to the correspondence between momentum subtraction scheme and minimal subtraction schemes. There are no confirmed uh, contradictions between these two schemes. Okay? Actually, a minimal subtraction scheme was just simplification invented for this purpose. However, at low energies, if you go to the infrared, okay, at low energies, then there is no correspondence at all then the dependence on k-square has nothing to do with divergences and nothing to do with the mu-square, because mu-square always follows the divergences. I'm repeating a little bit, okay, but I want that everybody understand and remember this main idea of these two lectures. Okay, so let us consider the limits of the expression y in two cases, ultraviolet. So we have this a-square, and in the ultraviolet it becomes a constant. It goes to 2. And then this our integral, okay, becomes this guy. So what it means? It means that uh, m squared disappeared because we made the limit of m going to zero. And now divergences, ultraviolet divergences, logarithmic divergences, uh, they fit, they have coefficients which fit m mu log of k square. And log of k square fits the mu square. So in the ultraviolet, you can take derivative with mu square or you can take derivative with k square. The difference is only the sign. Okay, the rest is the same. Now, in the infrared, in, for inf in the infrared, it's completely different because then you, you have the following situation. Uh, y becomes this guy, so there is no logarithm. What it means? The, lo the divergence is there. The log of mu square is there but there is no log of k-square. So any relation between momentum and mu is lost. Mu lost any physical sense in the infrared. Okay? In the infrared, k-square is the parameter, okay? and mu-square does not exist. Of course, we subtract divergences in the same way. We can fix mu if we, win, if we want by some renormalization condition. No problem. But in the infrared, you don't have logarithms of k. This is uh, Appelquist and Carasone theorem, uh, which they found in 75. Questions? No. Good. So, elect uh, okay, so beta functions. Uh, I will not speak much about beta functions in this uh, mini course, but the idea is the following. If we want to calculate beta functions in the momentum subtraction scheme, then we have to make the subtraction when p square equal to some parameter, let's call it m square, and then the beta function is defined in this way, okay, and we have this definition of the beta function. Uh, now, uh, for example, if you follow this scheme in uh, QED, okay, it means in this case the loop of fermions, quantum fermions, and two lines of photon. Then the beta function uh, calculated in this way in momentum subtraction scheme for the electric charge has this form. In the ultraviolet, you get the textbook formula, which is absolutely the same as in the minimal subtraction scheme. And the infrared, we observe quadratic decoupling. This is literally the Appelquist and Carasson result. Now, you can see, of course, that the formula is not that simple. Okay? Sometimes people think that uh, what you get is something like log of uh, p square plus m square divided by, by mu square. No, not exactly. The behavior of this expression is exactly this, qualitatively. But not formula literally does not reproduce this. Please. Uh, 
Sure. Yeah, always, as I said at the beginning, ultraviolet means that uh, the energy coming to the loop from external lines is much more than the mass of the field in the loop. And infrared means that this energy is much less than, than the mass of the field in the loop. Okay? Gustav. Which A? Ah, okay. Look, I put it with red color. This is A. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I mean, <laughs> so, so, no, no, no. Look, guys, we have 33 transparencies for one hour and 20 minutes. So, so we're not in a hurry. Okay, <laughs> so ask as much as you want. No problem. Uh, if I'm not happy with the question, you must be even more happy. Don't worry. This is what I always tell to my students. <laughs> so, uh, ah. Good. Capital M is the momentum. Okay, it's just a way of writing formulas. Actually, I'm afraid that here is some misprint. Okay, and mu is an artificial parameter of renormalization. Artificial parameter of renormalization. It, it becomes very, very clear if you look to this. You see, if you want to uh, have logarithmic form factor in the ultraviolet, then you, you have log of k square. But k square is dimensional. And we don't know how to take logarithm of dimensional quantity. So we need some parameter to make it dimensionless. However, in the massless case, there is no such parameter, no mass. So what we do? We put mu by hand. Okay, so mu is something you put by hand, okay, and then when you use uh, randomization group in the minimal subtraction scheme, everything works fine, but you find the dependence of something which does not exist on mu. And then you have to be smart and, and associate mu to some physical parameter. Here, in this case, it's fairly easy because you see that mu is something related to k-square, okay? And in other cases, it may be not easy to associate. Okay, I will show you some example which where nobody know how to do it. I would like to know, to, uh, okay, but I don't know, and nobody else know. So this is uh, the mu part, because sometimes we don't have analog of this momentum subtraction scheme, which works, uh, works here in such a simple way. So, and then we suffer, okay? We need to, uh, we, we need to be smarter than we are. Okay, this is what means uh, running in the two schemes. You see, the, uh, this dashed line is the running in the minimal, uh, minimal subtraction scheme. So it corresponds to the dependence on mu. So we see that it is absolutely the same in the ultraviolet and in the infrared. This T is a log of uh, energy or mu or something. Okay, both go to infinity in the same way. Now, continuous line is dependence on momenta. So at high energies, it is basically the same as dashed line. There is small shift between the two, but they become straight lines. It's logarithmic uh, dependence, okay, this log of t. Now, but in the infrared, things change a lot. Uh, dashed line continues its artificial life, which has nothing to do with reality, and the continuous line becomes constant. Why it becomes constant? Because there is decoupling. Okay, so we have decoupling in this case, and this plot shows this very well. Now, Yes, if you want. And, yeah, uh, in the lev at the level of effective action in the ultraviolet, we have this expression. So we just have f menu, f menu, and in, in between we have logarithmic form factor, poorly logarithmic form factor with a beta function. Is this beta function is minimal subtraction beta function. Now, if we make things in the momentum sub subtraction scheme, mass dependent uh, scheme and so on, then uh, the formula is like that, and it's not simple at all, actually, because this logarithmic part is universal, as Salam explained to people 73 years ago. But the rest is not universal at all, and we found here something which we call multiplicative, actually people called before us multiplicative anomaly, so and so on and so forth. So this finite part is not universal. It can depend on some details of calculations, Okay, but the Apelquist and Carasone is always there. I mean, you, in all versions of this multiplicative anomaly, you always have quadratic decoupling. But the coefficients may, may be a little bit different. Okay, uh, good. 
So let's go to semi-classical gravity. In semi-classical semi gravity case, uh, so we, uh, we meet uh, in, in, from what we, if we start to think what we can have, we have these three diagrams. Here, uh, wavy line is uh, this gravitational perturbation, okay, uh, arbitrary completely arbitrary, it's not necessarily graviton, because graviton is the gravitational perturbation which has so, uh, follow some restrictions, so there are only two degrees of freedom, right? And here we need all 10 degrees of freedom of the H menu field, which is a symmetric tensor field. And then we have, in principle, three diagrams. What happens is that the last tadpole diagram should be removed. Why? Because here is internal line of gravitational field. And this line means that you quantize gravity. And we wanted to uh, calculate for semi-classical gravity. So from this point of view, this tadpole diagram should be removed. And we have to work with the bubble diagram and snail diagram. It's recently, Wagner explained me that this guy is called snail before I called it uh, tadpole without the neck. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but it is called snail. So. What, so forget about the tadpole and think about only these two diagrams. What is interesting is the following. Both diagrams contribute to the ultraviolet divergences. So if you are interested in the pole, 1 over n minus 4, both diagrams contribute. But of course, this guy does not contribute to the form factor. So it looks like a miracle if the logarithmic limit of the form factor, which comes from this diagram, corresponds to the divergence which comes from both diagrams. Still, this happens. This is exactly what we met in the calculations. And, yeah, and this is an uh, interesting moment. Second interesting moment is that, in principle, uh, gravity is tricky in the sense, as we learned probably from Gabriel's lectures, uh, so <laughs> gravity is very, very complicated. So when we calculate these two diagrams, uh, we have rich tensor structures with two indexes on the left and two indexes on the right. And on top of that, we have these form factors, okay? And these form factors come with a different, very different powers of K, of K, of momenta. So the problem is uh, separate these huge form factors to different terms in the effective action, okay? Make the correspondence with the effective action. How it is done? So we know that... Uh, This, uh, behind these formulas, there is covariant result. The, the, the result is not covariant because I use non-covariant parameterization. But behind it, there is a covariant effective action. And this can be proved, actually. Uh, there are uh, different formal proofs of this, okay? including uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, ours and other people. And actually, people started to realize this by early 80s, maybe even 70s. Okay, so by the end of the day, you may have four terms to put here the form factor. One is the square of the wild tensor. Later on, I will give you explicit formula. Then there is R square, the square of the uh, scalar curvature, Einstein term, and lambda. All these four terms have completely different tensor structures. It means In principle, you can, if you calculate the second uh, order expression, in H menu perturbation, then you can have these five tensor structures. Uh, this double delta of Dirac, uh, product of two metrics, this guy, this guy, and this guy. So we have five structures. So we have to note that, for example, lambda term, cosmological constant, only has these two terms, okay, if you expand them. That means that if you meet A3, A4, and A5 type terms, they cannot be attributed to lambda, but they can perfectly well be attributed to R, to R square, and to C square. In fact, it's more complicated. For example, R square does not have the first term at all. It does not appear. It only has A2. So if you find the A1, A1 can be attributed to C square or to R. Okay? In general, you have a kind of a set of linear relations, which can be solved and were solved, and after that everything is fixed. We have perfectly uh, well uh, form factors separate for C square and for R square. And with these two terms, we meet a surprise, as I will explain to you. So this is the first paper when everything was done by diagrams. And then Codeo and Zanusso, uh, Alessandro Codeo, uh, he is here in Uruguay, 
and Omar Zanusso, who is now in Pisa, they made exactly the same calculation, I would say. No, a little bit different. I will, I will uh, give a comment after, uh, and uh, uh, sometime after, and had exactly the same result, I would say, in this part which I will show you. So this is the result. So we see that here in this square of the while tensor part, we have this form factor. We have the same y, okay, with the logarithm hidden inside as before, and then some dependence on the coefficient a. In the r square part, in the r square part, we have some y, the same y with some coefficient. Okay, he is here xi t with still the means xi minus 1 over 6 because these formulas correspond to non-minimal scalar field. Okay, and uh, formula can be bigger, but uh, qualitatively it's always the same thing. Y multiplied by something, okay, and something without Y, which is basically irrelevant because it has no logarithm. And here in the cosmological constant part, because why it's cosmological constant? Because there is no R, no R squared or something you see that there is no form factor. And here in R term, you also don't have form factor. This is bad, okay? <laughs> this is bad. And this is what Cadelio uh, and Zanusso tried to resolve in the following way. They just calculated form factor for R without paying attention that this uh, actually uh, uh, is may maybe physically not very well justified. I will explain a little bit later. So this is the result for the form factor verified by several authors, let's say, by us and by other people. Now, yeah, here we go. Uh, now, this calculation was done only for scholars with diagrams because it's not easy. The calculation is like I have it, uh, Edward Gorber can calculate, I have something like uh, 190 pages. So it's not uh, very easy to do. But when we did it, we wanted to check it. And then we uh, uh, saw it a little bit, and we remembered this result by Barvinsky and Wilkowski and Barvinsky, and this parallel work of Avramidi, who was in the same group at that time. And these people uh, solved the same problem in a very general way. So they found the solution for the heat kernel, okay? And it has this form. This is the heat kernel solution for any theory which has the operator like box plus something box plus, plus p, okay? And you see that here is integral over s, and the rest is very similar to what we discussed before. And there are five different terms, f1, f2, f3, f4, f5. These terms have uh, these formulas, and the integral, of course, no surprise, is exactly the same as we had in the diagrams. So we started with Eduard uh, Gorbar, and we checked the same calculation. We found perfect fit between this heat kernel formula and uh, diagrams. And after that, we started to calculate for, for fermions, for uh, massive vectors. For anti then we calculate with other people for anti-symmetric fields, uh, for, <laughs> for everything we could invent. So if you suggest me tomorrow new theory to calculate, it will be done. Okay, because it's actually, uh, there is a program on, the, on my laptop, on, uh, over there, huh? and uh, other people have, my students have, so uh, this takes, uh, let's say, a couple of hours to calculate form factors in any theory you can imagine, if the operator is box plus pi. Okay, good. And then we did this work also with uh, Sebastian Francine Vinas, Tiberio de Paul Neto, uh, and... Uh, Omar Zanusso, we, when we recalculate this once again, we confirm the result, and we had this form factor for R term. Let me spend a little bit of time and explain uh, what we have for the R, what is the problem with R term. First of all, let's go to ultraviolet. In the ultraviolet, uh, we saw that for the Einstein term and for uh, cosmological constant, there is no log logarithm, so there is no reason to speak about ultraviolet. But for C square and for R square, there is uh, all reason to uh, full reasons. There are full full reasons to discuss ultraviolet, and ultraviolet means that you get this uh, action. Some people think that this is universal form of quantum corrections or in any theory. This is not true. This is. Uh, a universal form of quantum corrections, but only if your quantum fields are massless. 
if you have massive quantum fields, you have something uh, more uh, less elegant, let's, let's say, like this. <laughs> okay, so so you don't have just primitive logarithm. We have something more complicated. Okay, very good. This is uh, what we have in the ultraviolet. So uh, actually, uh, I will show you later on that this first term, for example, is the one of the key elements of the so-called conformal anomaly. And the second term also uh, tells us a lot about conformal anomaly. Actually, conformal anomaly comes from this expression and, and its generalizations. Okay, let's, uh, I, I, today it's not a lecture about conformal anomaly, so I will not go deep in this part. I'll just show you one application in the end. Now, in the infrared, in the infrared, as before, we just say that mass is dominating over momenta, and we have this expression. So what we see, we see that here we meet Appelquist and Carasone theorem for the semi-classical gravity in, the, uh, in this part, in the c square term. For the r square term, we also have exactly this, but only if xi is uh, different from 1 over 6. Is xi is equal to 1 over 6, then the difference is that you have no uh, logarithm at all in ultraviolet. Okay? Why? Because beta 4 is 0 in this case. But in the infrared, the structure is like that, exactly. I did not put this formula, I think, because I just wanted to make it shorter. Okay? So, uh, what about the cosmological constant and R terms? Certainly from the physics side, this is most interesting part. Because imagine we have quantum correction to the cosmological constant, logarithmic or not. Imagine we have quantum correction to the R term, logarithmic or not. This immediately means that we have variable cosmological constant in the infrared, for instance. If you have light fields, very light fields, like photon, you have photon, right? Then you have logarithmically running cosmological constant in the ultraviolet and in the infrared, which would be a great thing to have because it means that we immediately can uh, start to apply this to cosmology. We have uh, equation of state for the cosmological constant different from minus one and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, nothing like this we have. Why? Because let's think once again. For the electromagnetic field, as I told you, you have this expression, right? So you have log between two f's. For the square of the wild tensor, we have log between two wild tensors. Always forget to put these indexes up. I mean, it's like uh, 20 years that I forget to do it. <laughs> so, no, I'm joking, but uh, partially not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but for the cosmological constant, this is impossible. Why? Because box acting on the cosmological constant gives you zero. Because derivative of the constant vanishes. We all know that. Okay, now, derivative of R does not vanish, but it is full de total derivative. And total derivative in the action, uh, at least according to common wisdom, does not affect the equations of motion. Okay? Now, I? More than, than me? <laughs> okay. Ah, he agrees. Okay. No, this is correct. I will comment uh, later on. Uh, probably I will show part which you will not agree. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. There will be fun for everybody. <laughs> so, so, yeah, this first, this was uh, later on, this was repeated, this logic with box R and box uh, constant uh, in many papers, but first one, it was written in this work with Gorbar. And then with Joan Sola, we had the paper when we discuss at all possible ways which we could imagine to find some randomization group for lambda. Actually, randomization group for lambda, in some sense, is more uh, interesting because lambda is very small. You know that rho lambda is something like 10 minus 47 GV4. So any running, even very small running, would mean a lot of physical consequences. Actually, the running of, of R of uh, Einstein term also has consequences. Like we have paper with uh, Patricio Letelier from Campinas, who passed away, and with David Rodriguez, when we, with this running, we could fit perfectly uh, rotation curves of the galaxies, better than any dark matter profile. It really fits 
But yeah, you need to choose some identification of mu, and then you have all all galaxies that you could try. I think he tried after like 200 galaxies. It always works, but it does not have uh, a real interpretation. Unfortunately, I will show you. It has interpretation. It does not have uh, quantum field theory background. Solid, I mean. The, well, you can ask the following question. This is the advanced part, I would say, of the talk, uh, of my lecture. Okay, how we can separate? We have effective action. It's all mixed. How you can uh, separate? Imagine that I did it in the second order in curvatures, but you can calculate third order in curvatures in any order. How you separate the part which corresponds to cosmological constant from the part which corresponds to R term and part which corresponds to R squared, to R cube, and so on? The the prescription which I would suggest is the following. Let's take a global scaling for the metric. So we make this transformation of the metric with lambda constant. Then we see that R transforms like that, box like that, and so on. So square uh, root of minus G transforms like uh, exponential of uh, 4 lambda. This is my symbol for D for X square root minus G. I will just use this integral with X. R gives you exponential of 2 lambda. And this guy has no exponential at all. This helps a lot. So you may say that all terms in the effective action which have exponential of 4 lambda, you may say, OK, this is cosmological constant. If you have 2 lambda, you have, OK, this is R term. And this is, without exponential, it is uh, R square. If you have exponential with negative power, then it is R cube, and so on and so forth. Let me give you an example from completely different science. If you take completely massless fields, calculate anomaly, then integrate anomaly, then this is the result. This is the uh, so-called anomaly-induced effective action of gravity. This first term is the conformally invariant functional, which is integration constant of this process. And here we have a lot of terms. Uh, for example, these green functions, G, are different, maybe different green functions of the same operator, which is called Panates operator. Okay, Panates was American mathematician, which invented it one year later, uh, compared to Fratkin and Saitlin, who did it for super, uh, conformal supergravity. But uh, people used to call it Panates operator, and me too. So what we can see, this is no local action, complicated. Is it correction to which part of effective action? The answer is to C square and R square, because the global scaling is exactly like the square of the wild tensor. For instance, you have here square of the wild tensor, G, G uh, scales like inverse of this guy, and you have Gauss Bonnet, and this A4 is Gauss Bonnet, and two thirds of box R. So the global scaling of this action is like a square of the curvature. So this is quantum correction to the square of the curvature, and not to the cosmological constant, not to the R term. What is interesting about this formula, I will say this again on the next transparency, is the following. We get this integrating scalars, fermions, and vectors. And all these fields have some green functions. There are scalar green functions, vector green functions, and fermion green functions. And they all are massless. However, in this section, there is nothing like that. There is no green function of scalar, no green function of uh, vector or, ten or spinner. Here is green function of completely artificial uh, Panates operator. It means that on the way from primitive calculations of effective action by diagrams and this elegant and short formula, we make a kind of resummation okay, of the terms. And this gives us this result. This was discussed a lot. Uh, in uh, early 90s uh, by Desert Schwimmer, Desert and so on. But uh, uh, the, the answer is this. So, if we won't have logarithm and, uh, and such that this logarithm, like this term, contributes to the running of the cosmological constant, then this logarithm should be inserted into this structure. For instance, this is a possible example. Here is we have Ricci and Ricci, and in between there is one of the box square. So the global scaling of this term is exactly like a cosmological constant. The global scaling of this term is exactly like an R term. Okay, those two are examples. You can construct infinitely many terms uh, of the same kind. It's easy. So the problem is, when we calculate uh, form factors, we do not meet logarithms in these terms. We have these terms. I will show you in the next transparencies, but without logarithm. And this is, in some sense, tragic, because it means that we cannot calculate quantum corrections to the cosmological constant and to R term. Now, 
Uh, let me show you. Uh, oh. Sure. Yeah, I will show you right now how you can get it, but in an inconsistent way. <laughs> okay? So, so you take this, our result, okay, with Gorber, which I mentioned before. It is exact result. It cannot be corrected. Okay? Let me stress this. So, and you do the following operation. You take this form factor for the square of the wild tensor. You can do it with the second two. Okay? It has log box. And then... The coefficient of it is some thing which depends on mass square and k square. So let us do the following. Let us expand this coefficient in this power series in m square over k square. And then we, in the second order of expansion, there will be zero order of expansion first and second. In the second order of expansion, you get exactly the thing you need to climb the running of the cosmological constant. Is it correct way of doing things? No. Why? For two reasons. First reason is that you took log, log of k omega, and k omega has log on the, in the ultraviolet. It does not have log in the infrared. We remember this. So you took ultraviolet part and start to make it infrared, which is not possible physically. But another part is also very relevant, that tensor structure of this term and tensor structure of the cosmological constant are different, and they cannot be uh, mixed. Okay, they are different. You can, with these five tensor structures, which I showed you before, you can see easily that they are distinct. Okay? So this way of doing things uh, does not work. It was explained in this paper with Gorbar. We joined forces with him recently again for this purpose. Questions? No. Okay. So, yeah. So... Does it mean that the cosmological constant doesn't run, that the Newton constant doesn't run? Unfortunately not, or fortunately. So you can do the following, you see. Uh, the naive thinking means that if you have green function of massive field, you make the same expansion as, if, as I show you in the first transparencies, and then there is no chance, because you immediately suppress all M4 terms, and you never get your... Uh, you never get logarithmic running, or even sublogarithmic running, okay? However... There may be terms like this, with the infinite product of curvatures and uh, green functions. Okay? These terms cannot be ruled out. I, I at least I don't know how to uh, prove that these terms do not appear if you calculate even one loop, because it is perturbative in uh, one in sense of loops, but it may be non-perturbative in sense of curvatures. Of course, all the methods of calculating in curved space, which we have, Okay, or almost all, are related to the expansion in H menu, in weak metric. So it's all essentially expansion in the series in curvatures. So the methods which we have cannot help to calculate this guy. Okay, uh, uh, some people uh, know how to calculate on the sphere or, or co with constant radius or on the sitter. Uh, once again, it does not work because then it will be zero. So you need some new method of calculations in order to verify that this is zero, this does not appear in quantum corrections, or find it, which would be much more uh, interesting. Let's say you need to develop a qualitatively new method of calculations in semi-classical gravity. I would say that I tried and I failed. Uh, so uh, if so, some young people will try, it would be very interesting, okay? Is as uh, other difficult problems, uh, even if you don't solve it by the end of the day, you will get something. <laughs> so, but it's not, not easy, probably. Okay, I can imagine that it will not be easy for anybody. So, what we can say is the following we cannot prove that the cosmological constant does not run in the physical sense, not on dependence on mu. Dependence on mu is very simple to get. But the question is, if we want to work with mu, we have to associate mu with some physical parameter. It is a different story. I don't like to tell it here. But there is a big business about this. So there are many papers trying to identify mu with one thing or another, our papers and other people, and so on and so forth. So I will not go to this direction. Uh, so once again, this action induced by anomaly is a very explicit example that this kind of resummation is possible. Because uh, at some point, people said that if you calculate uh, uh, using Barvinsky and Wilkowski uh, technique, uh, okay, uh, with a heat kernel, 
Uh, then in the third order in curvatures, in the third order in curvatures, you already get anomaly. And this is fourth order in curvature. You can see that critical terms are C square, Gauss, Bonnet, and G, which is zero order in curvature. So this is fourth order. So there was a confusion. People said that three is different from four. Okay, everybody knows that. But it doesn't work this way because in gravity, you can just make commutation of two covariant derivatives and you get an extra curvature. This is basically the reason why simple logic related to expansion in curvatures uh, is not always uh, working, okay? Sometimes it works, sometimes not. So here we are with the running of the cosmological constant and uh, let me go to the last part. I think I will end earlier. <laughs> so, so I can add uh, like 20 transparencies for tomorrow to compensate. <laughs> so, so I'm joking. So, uh, so additional observation about race anomaly. First of all, how we derive anomaly? So you see, uh, this is the effective fraction in the ultraviolet. Remember, anomaly is something which corresponds to the massless field and with some extra conditions for scalar, let's say. So this is what we get for, uh, for the massless field, the logarithmic form factor between two uh, wild tensors. We can use this parameterization of the metric, okay, extract the conformal factor. I, I used to put it to the exponent, formulas become shorter. And then we see that everything except the logarithm is invariant. Okay? It's very easy to verify. But the box which is inside the logarithm uh, transforms like this. What it means? Uh, taking the anomaly, anomaly is this operator applied to the action, is equivalent to taking derivative with sigma. This is, uh, I have to give you exercises. And remember first that there are hundreds of exercises in the book which I mentioned, okay? So you can use it, including in this part uh, about anomaly. And this is very simple exercise. You can do it in a half an hour, I guess, at most, okay? So anomaly is basically the reaction of the action to variation of sigma. Good. So once again, the same formulas. Now sigma is depending on x, so it's not a constant. And if we take this with this quadratic uh, expression in wild tensor, it gives you zero. But because of this logarithm, it gives you exactly beta 1 c square, which is something related to, uh, something related to uh, anomaly, because this is a part of anomaly. Now, with the gauss bonnet gauss bonnet is this structure. Imagine I made the calculations, and then inside the each, maybe I write it, okay? because we have time, why not? So we will have E4, okay, which is R menu alpha beta square minus four R menu square plus R square. So it, uh, uh, if you add quantum corrections, then it becomes like R menu alpha beta log minus box over mu square uh, R, may, maybe I better trade mu nu for something else like kappa omega. Uh, kappa omega alpha beta minus 4 R kappa omega log minus box over mu square R kappa omega and plus R log minus box over mu square R. Okay? By the way, I wrote this formula. This formula is correct, but I don't know how to calculate it. So if somebody, by diagrams, because if you calculate it by diagrams, it gives you zero. So, so it's quite interesting that somebody, it's another exercise, which is on the different level. Let's say you can invent how to calculate this, and uh, uh, I, I think it would be interesting, let's say. I don't know. <laughs> but this formula is correct because, and if, you obtain this for it's strange. Yeah, I said I don't know how to calculate, but I believe that it is correct because I know that it appears from many other ways, okay, of calculation. And then you get exactly the same thing for the Gauss Bonnet term. And so I as I said here, we are close to arrive at the standard form of the anomaly, which includes C square, this for scalar field, uh, Gauss Bonnet and box R. So the remaining question is with this box R. So if uh, we take the scalar field with uh, xi, if we want conformal field, we have to put mass to zero, 
and Xi to 1 over 6. Then we have conformal scalar field as Penrose discovered in 1960. Okay, and then if we take the uh, form factor, which I show you before, Kr, and make the limit uh, of these limits, then we obtain this guy. So you see the form factor does not have logarithmic part, which is natural because there is no beta functions, no divergences for R squared, okay? But there is a finite contribution of R squared. If we apply to this, F, is this part of effective action? It's quantum contribution, yeah, right? So if we apply our operator to this guy, you don't need even go to sigma. Okay, you can go, of course, the result is the same. Then you get 12 box R. And this gives you this result for the scalar field. But, but, uh, it ni it's nice because if you use other regularizations like point splitting regularization, which most powerful method to calculate, Z regularization, and almost all other regularizations, then you have exactly the same coefficient. This uh, plus two for scalar and other coefficients, uh, positive for fermion and negative for vector. The question is, uh, is it true for all regularizations? No, only for the most of regularization, because in dimensional regularization, the coefficient is different. And I will show you, using these form factors, how you can get also different coefficients for pauli willers regularization. The fact that in dimensional regularization it's different, it was known from uh, the first papers of uh, Mike Duff and his collaborators in late 70s. Then you can find discussion of this in the book by Birrell Davis. And uh, we solve it in this paper with Manuel, uh, who is here, uh, Gorbar, and myself. We solve this problem, I think, uh, completely for dimensional regularization. The point is that in dimensional regularization, when you add the counter term, uh, you may take C square in four dimensions, because C square is the square of the wild tensor, and it depends on the dimension. You can take it in four dimensions, but you can take it in n dimensions, because you have to make subtraction in out of four dimensions. Or you can take it in the dimension, uh, you can take it in the dimension d equals uh, n plus gamma uh, 4 minus n, with arbitrary gamma. All these subtractions are perfectly well uh, consistent. Why? Because everything you want from the counter term is that first, it cancels divergence, and second, it must be local and covariant. And it, it is local and covariant. The formula is something like c square of d. I maybe, maybe I make a mistake, but you will forgive me, I guess. Okay? So it is something like 4 uh, uh, over d minus 2. Uh, R mu nu square and plus uh, 1 over, no, 2. 2 over d minus 1, d minus 2 R square. So you see that these coefficients depend on dimension. So if I change gamma, the, uh, the result changes. Okay, the question is which gamma is correct? Which of these gammas is correct? Uh, what uh, people did in the epoch of Duff uh, and uh, uh, David, Beryl Davis and so on is to take d equal 4. And this gave them a perfect result for scholars and spinners. I think they were not lucky with this. And wrong result for vectors. But in fact, uh, any gamma works very well. And what we found with Manuel and Ed Ed Edward was that uh, changing gamma is absolutely equivalent to adding R square or a Ricci square or Riemann square, of course, doesn't matter, to your classical action. So the ambiguity which we have in dimensional regularization is exactly the possibility to add R square by hand to your classical action of gravity. This is the, the answer, okay? But we were curious whether we can find another example of ambiguity because it's nice that you have one ambiguity understand it. And uh, like Duff, he wrote in uh, 94 a very nice review about conformal anomaly. And he said that he feels uneasy about this question. And I think we explained. So, but <laughs> regardless, this paper was not very well appreciated. So I was banned in the journal Nuclear Physics B 
for eight years after that. So my papers were not considered. And after that, I did not try. <laughs> so, so, but it happens. <laughs> some, some people uh, have special views on uh, things. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And here we have a uh, yeah, situation when, when uh, this uh, happens, but we can find, we, we check at some other organizations, we invented a cutoff in the, uh, how to say, proper time integral, right? And everything was without ambiguity, but then uh, Manuel used the scheme which he invented before for three-dimensional uh, Young Mills or something like that, Chern Simon series, and it worked, and we found another ambiguity. So how it works? Uh, yeah, it was originally invented by Andrei Slavnov, whom uh, Manuel mentioned in the morning. So you add regulator fields. It is a set of scalar fields. These scalar fields have different masses. They are regulators, okay, so they are not physical. They are going to disappear uh, after we use them. They have different xi, okay, this xi tilde means uh, something, because the sum is xi without tilde. Good. So uh, we have to integrate over our scalar field or other fermion or uh, vector field, and then we add the integrals over this auxiliary field, the uh, regulator fields. And these regulator fields have different statistics, or Grassmann parity, better say. So some of them are fermions, and some of them are uh, bosons. So it means that contributions of these fields enter with plus or minus sign, depending on our uh, mood, let's say, or interest. Okay. So then we can say that masses are all proportional to one single huge parameter, m, which is going to go to infinity. And mu are specific small numerical parameters which don't go to infinity, okay? They are like uh, parameters to which we will find. So we require that all uh, divergences uh, should be cancelled. I mean, quartic divergences, quadratic divergences, logarithmic divergences in all sectors of effective action. And this gives this set of uh, conditions, okay? This can be extended including to scalar field. We did it recently with uh, Wagner and uh, Publio, who is another PhD student in Juiz de Fora. So, by the end of the day, the solutions are like that. And you see that all these coefficients, S1, S2, uh, means that there are one copy of the field with the first mass, and it is boson. This means there are four copies of the scalar field uh, with, the, okay, with the mass m uh, mu2, with coefficient mu2, and it is boson. And these three guys are fermions. Okay? And then we have these mu's. Everything works very well, but for xi, there are two solutions. Xi equal to mu square and xi equal to zero. Both perfectly well resolve the problem, okay? They cancel divergences. But the uh, effective action, this box R part in the anomaly, is different. It depends on your choice for xi, okay? And then uh, you have an ambiguity. It means that in the pauli Wheelers you have different uh, possibilities for the R square in the effective action, finite R square in the effective action, or to box R in the anomaly, which is the same thing. Good. So we see that actually uh, here we can use these form factors in a new way for completely massless theory. Uh, so in this expression, uh, you don't need, uh, you already sent mass m, uh, large mass, to infinity, so it is uh, completely regulated. So and let me go to uh, conclusions of this first part. So, uh, so if we won't uh, just remove divergences in curved space, space time, then we don't have problems. We just remove divergences, uh, uh, the theory can be renormalizable. Uh, the theory is renormalizable, but the price to pay is that we have to include these R square terms, uh, R, uh, Ricci terms, uh, square, Riemann square, and R square, or if you want use another basis, which is more useful, square of the wild tensor, square of, square of the scalar curvature, and gauss bonnet Without these terms, uh, the theory is not renormalizable. This means that uh, the problems with four derivative action starts already at the level of semi-classical gravity. 
which is something serious because uh, we know that semi-classical gravity means that we quantize matter fields and don't quantize gravity. And we know very well that two things. First, that matter fields should be quantized. So we have standard model and other confirmations, electrodynamics. And second, we know that the space-time is curved. Okay? So if we put these things together, we see that uh, if we do not include four derivative terms in the classical action, uh, we are in trouble because these terms come back with the divergent coefficients, and we cannot remove them in a regular way. We can just make primitive subtraction, of course, but then we uh, are left with a lot of ambiguity, uncontrolled, which is not good. So now, if assuming that we agreed to introduce four derivative terms into the classical action, we meet a problem to calculate the corrections, the quantum corrections. The most interesting would be uh, the corrections to the cosmological constant and R term, and this we don't know how to do. Uh, however, we know how to calculate uh, corrections to the square of the wild tensor and to the square of the scalar curvature. This we know how to do very well, and this shows perfect agreement between ultraviolet divergences and uh, logarithmic form factors, okay, which is very important because there is no uh, any kind of uh, discrepancy between momentum subtraction scheme beta functions and minimal subtraction scheme beta functions in the ultraviolet. On the contrary, in the infrared, there is a discrepancy, as expected, according to the Appelquist and Carasone theorem, which we can extend to semi-classical gravity. And then we uh, uh, end up with some cor corrections to the same terms in the uh, infrared, to C square and to R square. It would be quite interesting to have this, to, to have this correction to the gauss bonnet but as I said, this calculation was never done. Uh, I can tell you how it can be done, but it's not uh, really easy to do, because uh, maybe it's worth to make some observation. This term is a surface term. It's a topological, but it's also a surface term. It's a good exercise to show that this is a total derivative. Okay? I, put, uh, I have also a book on tensors, and <laughs> it says that probably the most difficult exercise in the book of tensors, but I give some hint how to do it. It's not, not, not very difficult. But, so this is a surface term, very good. But this, with logarithmic insertions, is not a surface term. So, uh, yeah, so you need some, uh, combine this knowledge and to calculate this, this thing. Uh, the result is fixed, we know the result, but uh, uh, to calculate this would be, would be interesting. So, yeah, and so uh, for R and lambda, unfortunately, we, uh, we cannot uh, uh, neither calculate nor, uh, nor calculate neither uh, prove that it is zero. So we don't know. We, c we can calculate form factor for R, but it's not completely clear how to apply it. We are discussing this actually with somebody. So, yeah. So, once again, all this concerns this, uh, uh, what I call semi-classical gravity. We recently had a discussion with one colleague that he said semi-classical gravity is something different, but finally we agreed. So, the question is what happens with quantum gravity? Because in quantum gravity, uh, situation is much more complicated. We have massive degrees of freedom, as uh, we, uh, Manuel explained to us, and uh, so, w what is uh, Gabriel explained, and uh, actually uh, we have situation similar. We should expect that massive degrees of freedom will stop making contributions in the infrared. And in gravity, this is something very important because effective approach to quantum gravity is uh, today becoming a mainstream. So, uh, we are in a situation when uh, our calculations in effective quantum gravity depend on whether these massive degrees of freedom are decoupling or not. In, in, is, if they are decoupling, in, in the way they do it. Uh, there is no, at the moment, the answer to this question. It would be very, very interesting to have it. But I will show you in the next lecture tomorrow uh, that we have some hints, because we have some calculations in the model, in the toy model, which are for me, at least, very convincing, and they confirm, basically, 
what people uh, assumed from the very beginning in effective field theories. So this is for tomorrow. Thank you very much. It's just a simple question. Uh, could we use both of the, the, the possible values for this psi uh, that you showed in the slide before? Uh, at the same time, like if we maybe uh, do some average, like we use both like half of one, half of one. In this, this solution there, the, the psi two I don't think so. I understood your question, Lucas. But the, the, the look, look at these formulas. Those are the same psi. So if you take. Ah, you mean take part of psi equal to mu square and part of psi equal to zero, psi tilde. No, it will not work because why this guy with psi tilde equal to mu square works well? Because we have the same equation in equation number two. And if you remove one of these terms from here, it doesn't work. Makes sense. I, I see. Okay. Thank you. Probably you can... But this question is non-trivial because maybe you can put more scholars, more uh, regulators. Maybe Manuel knows this better. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. No, Manuel, Manuel, wait. But the, there are many solutions, but they give the difference in the final result? Probably yes. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. No, you are right. Okay, okay, okay. Ah, a very important thing, maybe it's very good uh, that this was asked, because this is once again, this is equivalent to adding R squared to the classical action. So compared to dimensional organization, there is no qualitative difference. And I would even say, that if we fix the scheme of calculations, there is no ambiguity. So all ambiguity is classical. All ambiguity is the right uh, which we uh, appropriate, let's say, to put R square by hand, which does not contradict anything. But in principle, uh, there is no other ambiguity except this. OK? Yeah, sure, but uh, exactly, but it's the same ambiguity. So uh, the, the point is that we quantize massless conformal scalar fields. And uh, ah, did you tell people that they will give seminars? After you stop talking. <laughs> ah, OK. <laughs> so good. So <laughs> because I was worrying about my seminar, you know. <laughs> so so, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so we start with the conformal uh, scalar vector c spinner fields. So it means that if we won't have renormalizable theory, it's sufficient for us to put con only conformal fields in the vacuum action. It's sufficient, but it's not sufficient condition. But it's not necessary condition. We can put R, cosmological constant. We can put R square, no problem. You can put R cube if you want by hand. And R square you also have to, have to put. All these terms enter as independent classical terms in the action. And the coefficients can be fixed only from experiment. OK? So exactly the same situation as with uh, cosmological constant with R and so on. And so on. OK? Uh, and for R square, actually, uh, if we believe to the Serebinsky model, the coefficient is like something like 5 multiplied by uh, 100 million. OK? For cosmological constant, everybody know. And for Newton constant, we also have good, uh, good evaluation. OK? Our analysis and that analysis, predictions to those parameters get harder to do, right? As I add terms, I add parameters, and my cosmological models get. Sure, but uh, no, no, be careful. Because what I said is the following that if we are interested in inflation, uh, the simplest inflationary model is the Rabinsky model. It's exactly this R square added to classical action. 
And then this coefficient is phenomenological. So you have to define it from uh, observations attributed to inflation, let's mm -hmm. say. Okay, because there are people who don't believe to inflation. They say there may be some epicrotic and other, you know this better yeah. than me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so uh, this is legitimate parameter to define. Same with cosmological constant. It's the simplest possible constant. And cosmological constant is important to remember that you cannot have consistent quantum field theory without cosmological constant in carpet space. You need it. So when people replace cosmological constant by quintessence or some, some whatever else, they trade something which they don't like to much worse, for sure, from the point of view of quantum field theory. The cosmological constant problem is the problem of quantum field theory, not of cosmology. Okay, in cosmology, it's just parameter to measure. But in quantum field theory, it is uh, the problem of uh, fine-tuning and things like that. But it's not, uh, it's a very serious problem, but not, uh, not, not what I said yesterday about mm. parameter, because it's a real minimal parameter what you have, okay? Can, can you explain a little better why in, in uh, why adding fields like intestines, uh, it's much worse because it defines, it's something to do with Well, the I can explain, definition. but it's not the same as this lecture. So, uh, okay, maybe, maybe we have like five minutes. So, the problem is that you have a classical action, which includes 1 minus 16pg uh, integral xr, uh, minus integral x rho, rho lambda, where rho lambda is lambda over, over 8 pg, right? The density of the cosmological constant term. This is classical. But then you have something like uh, Higgs mechanism, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and things like that. It means that you have potential of scalar field. I, I will just write it for a real scalar, because the science is uh, basically the same which is uh, minus m square over 2, uh, phi square, and uh, plus lambda over 4 uh, factorial phi 4, okay? And then you have this uh, Mexican head type of uh, potential, and it gives you like this, okay? And we are supposed to exist here in the minimum. So you have this constant, we are oscillating, our world is oscillating near the minimum. And so all this guy goes to the, uh, to rho lambda, because then rho lambda, you get rho lambda induced, which is uh, minus, which is plus v uh, in the point f uh, phi minimum, okay, fm, right? So what you observe as a cosmological constant is rho lambda observed, equal to rho lambda, well, let's put it rho lambda vacuum to distinguish, plus uh, rho lambda induced. There is a very good paper by uh, Rovelli and Bianchi, Eugenio Bianchi, and they, until this point, they explained it perfect. And then they make one thing which I cannot agree, and I think is wrong. But uh, until this point, everything is fine. So. Here starts the problem. What is the problem? What, this is a measurable parameter. Remember that rho lambda vacuum is an independent parameter from quantum field theory point of view, right? So when you have, for example, ultraviolet divergences in, uh, let's say, massive scalar field, okay? Then you have to renormalize this guy. And this renormalization is typically proportional to M4, where M is the mass of the field. Okay, if you have many different fields, quantum fields, so this will be uh, like something like sum over i m i four one half for scalars and minus j uh, two m j uh, four for fermions. This is a, a typical beta function with something like one over five four pi square and so on and so forth. So what we can observe is the following. That the running of this rho lambda vacuum is proportional to the force powers of the masses. And this contribution, okay, which we have here, is also proportional to the uh, m4, right? To the force power of the mass. 
So it means that each of these terms are proportional to the force power of the mass. What it means? In, like, uh, take a minimal standard model. Then M4 is about uh, 10 8 GV4. OK? And the observed value, the sum, is something like 10 minus 47 GV4. So there is 55 orders of the difference, of magnitude the difference. And this is tragic because, first of all, it means that we have to choose this parameter, which is uh, independent parameter, which we have to choose from experiment. But experiment is done for this guy. Here, it is absolutely normal quantity. It is about uh, 0 0.7 uh, rho critical. From cosmological point of view, there is no problem at all. It is a very good number, 0 0.7, right? But if we, at, at, which pro, at which moment we gain this problem with the 55 orders fine tuning, it is the moment when we are trying to be gods. We are trying to explain the space, the observed value of the cosmological constant, using particle physics. Particle physics is something you, you need to construct 28 kilometers of the uh, ring under Geneva, okay, spend a lot of money, spend a lot of work of workers, engineers, of everybody. It's highest energies we can get. And this is uh, the lowest energy we can get <laughs> because it's density of critical density, overall density of the universe. So, and we're trying to explain one thing from another. And at this moment, it comes back to us and we get this hierarchy problem. Okay, we have, uh, we need to fine tune this parameter with completely unbelievable 55 orders of magnitude. Okay, what it means? Weinberg in uh, 80, uh, Steven Weinberg, okay, in, uh, yeah, I think in 87, he published a short paper when he, he made an anthropic consideration. He calculated what can be the lambda observable such that we still can work, live in this universe. And the result was that, first of all, this guy cannot be zero. He must be, it must be positive. It should be positive, and it cannot be 100 times more than this. If it is 1,000 times more than that, we do not exist. The galaxies don't form. The heavy elements uh, in 13.8 billions of years of existence of the universe do, are not produced, and we are not here. Okay? So what it means is uh, this fine-tuning is something like <laughs> if somebody makes a mistake in the initial beginning of the universe, in the 50-second uh, digit, we are not here. You like it? Uh, nobody can like it. It's very strange. Remember that this uh, potential in the early universe was completely different because it was high temperature and probably it was like that. So when this term was introduced at the beginning of the universe, it was not tuning to zero of the sum. No. It was tuning to zero of the sum after first three seconds or first three years when <laughs> it cooled down and the potential became like that. So it's completely unbelievable. It is like uh, something very, very strange. This is called the cosmological constant problem. Okay? Now, what means quintessence? Quintessence means something like, you say, okay, by definition, rho lambda observable is zero. Why? From quantum field theory framework, there is no reason, for sure. Okay? Moreover, you need to have this uh, rho lambda vacuum because you need it to renormalize things. But you say, okay, I want it to be zero, okay, because I want. I have right to do it. Then you trade 55 orders of fine-tuning, which you did not like, to infinite order fine-tuning. But on top of that, you put by hand quintessence, another thing which has to replace rho lambda observable. And this quintessence you need to fine-tune to have your cosmological observables. And if you make a uh, fine-tuning on the level of cosmology, then it's fine. You, you make what you like with several parameters instead of one, exactly as we discussed. 
But if you want to do it on the level of quantum field theory, then you trade 55 for infinite plus infinite 55, which for me is not a good deal. So, so uh, <laughs> many, many years ago, uh, there was a conference in near Barcelona in San Filipe in 2001, organized by Brazilian uh, Jose Valle, who worked in Valencia. And uh, everybody was saying that quintessence solved the cosmological constant problem. And me and my collaborator were every time complaining that this is not true, this is not true, this is not true, until we are, were for, uh, I was forbidden to speak. <laughs> so, yeah, but <laughs> things happen. Huh? But at night we made a peace with chairman. <laughs> but the chairman, uh, by the way, was um, uh, Bloodman, who made big contribution to this area. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it happens, yeah. But the cosmological constant problem is another problem which has no solution for a while. So I would say there are two such problems. Cosmological constant problem, but here we at least understand that the origin is our ambiguity, uh, uh, ambitions. Okay, not ambiguity, our ambitions. Because we want to explain cosmology from particle physics. It doesn't work. Okay, we, wh who we are to do it. <laughs> right, but in quantum gravity it's somehow similar because there is a problem of massive ghosts as Gabriel uh, and Manuel explained us and also we don't have satisfactory solution for a while regardless I will show you tomorrow something which gives some uh, uh, in my opinion gives some relaxation to this okay more questions guys <laughs> So don't just live. Can now. I take, take it off? Oh yes, you can. Yes, you may. <laughs> so now we're going to have three.